My name's Pete Woods. You're watching Hexham TV. And thank you very much for joining us um, this evening to hear Stephen Tomlin, who's going to be reading The Canterville Ghost by Oscar Wilde. The wow. um, reading will last about 40 minutes. But before we start, Stephen, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about your uh, background and the sorts of uh, work that you've done in the past. Yes, well, uh, I trained as a drama teacher at Central School in London oh, a long time ago now, uh, 1969 to 72. And then I went uh, to this, a year's pre preliminary teaching in Manchester in the city schools. Uh, and then I came up to Teesside and worked at the Billingham Forum, um, becoming a drama workshops organiser, touring around Cleveland, giving you know, all sorts of drama work with all sorts of ages and backgrounds. And then I went to Lancaster to work with a theatre and education company at the Duke's Theatre and happened to stay for 40 years. I didn't mean to, it was only a year, but you know how these things happen. Um, and then when I got to the state retirement age, I, I left Lancaster where I'd been my base for many years, doing theatre and radio and television and bits of lecturing and so on. And then I came over here uh, to the northeast, uh, back to the northeast uh, in 2017. And I only wish I could have done it earlier. It's uh, just a lovely place to live. Uh, I was born and grew up in the West Country, and my youth was spent on Dartmoor, on the edges of Dartmoor. So when I'm up here, it kind of reminds me of it in lots of ways. Uh, so it's a lovely place to be, the friendliness of the people, and uh, just the quality of life here. It's just a great place to be. And I've made good friends here, and I feel very much at home. And doing this tonight is just another part of that, really, just finding my in the community and I think giving back to the community as they in so many ways have given good things to me. So this is a, as we know, a, a bit of an experiment for both of us, Pete and you and for me. And thank you audience for being out there uh, and supporting us this evening. I really appreciate it. And I do hope you enjoy this story as much as I've enjoyed kind of re-reading it again uh, as a classic piece of, uh, of writing by the inimitable Oscar Wilde. Over to you, Stephen. Oh, yes, I'll take a quick glass of water. And we're off. When Mr. Hiram B. Otis, the American minister to the court of St. James, bought Canterville Chase, everyone told him he was doing a very foolish thing. As there was no doubt at all that the place was haunted. Indeed, Lord Canterville himself was the man of the most punctilious honour, had felt it his duty to mention the fact to Mr Otis when they came to discuss terms. We have not cared to live in the place ourselves, said Lord Canterville, since my grand-aunt, the Dowager Duchess of Bolton, was frightened into a fit by two skeleton hands being placed on her shoulders as she was dressing for dinner. I feel bound to tell you, Mr Otis, that the ghost has been seen by several living members of my family. And Lady Canterville often got very little sleep at night in consequence of the mysterious noises that came from the corridor in the library. My lord, answered the minister, I will take the furniture and the ghost at evaluation. I have come from a modern country where we have everything that money can buy. I reckon that if there were such a thing as a ghost in Europe, uh, we'd have it at home in a very short time in one of our public museums or on a on the road as a show. I fear that the ghost exists, said Lord Canterville, smiling, though it may have resisted the overtures of your enterprising impresarios. It has been well known for three centuries, since 1584, in fact, and always makes its appearance before the death of any member of our family. Well, so does the family doctor, for that matter, Lord Canterville. But there is no such thing, sir, as a ghost. Well, if you don't mind a ghost in the house, so be it. Only you must remember that I warned you. A few weeks after this, the purchase was concluded. And at the close of the season, the minister and his family went down to Canterville Chase. Mrs Otis who, as Miss Lucretia R. Tappan, had been a celebrated New York belle, was now a very handsome middle-aged woman with fine eyes, 
and a superb profile. She had a magnificent constitution, a really wonderful amount of animal spirits. Indeed, in many respects, she was quite English and was an excellent example of the fact that we have really everything in common with America nowadays, except, of course, language. Her eldest son, christened Washington by his parents in a moment of patriotism, was a fair-haired, rather good-looking young man, well known as an excellent dancer. Miss Virginia E. Otis was a young girl of 15, a wonderful Amazon, lithe and lovely as a fawn, with a fine freedom in her large blue eyes. After Virginia came the twins, usually called the Stars and Stripes, and they were both delightful boys. As Canterville Chase is seven miles from Ascot, the nearest railway station, Mr Otis had telegraphed for a wet to meet them, and they started on their drive in high spirits. It was a lovely July evening, and the air was delicate with the scent of the pine woods. Now and then they heard a wood pigeon brooding over its own sweet voice, or saw, deep in the rustling fern, the burnished breast of the pheasant. As they entered the avenue of Canterville Chase, however, the sky became suddenly overcast with clouds. A curious stillness seemed to hold the atmosphere, and a great flock of rooks passed silently over their heads. And before they reached the house, some big drops of rain had started to fall. Standing on the steps to receive them was an old woman, neatly dressed in black silk with a white cap and apron. This was Mrs Umney, the housekeeper. She made them each a low curtsy as they alighted and said in a quaint old-fashioned manner, I bid you welcome to Canterville Chase. Following her, they passed through the fine Tudor hall into the library, a long low room panelled in black oak, at the end of which was a large stained glass window. Here they found tea laid out for them, and after taking off their wraps, they sat down and began to look around, while Mrs Umney waited on them. Suddenly, Mrs Otis caught sight of a dull red stain on the floor just by the fireplace, and quite unconscious of what it really signified, said to Mrs Umney, I'm afraid something has been spilled there. Yes, madam, replied the old housekeeper. Blood has been spilt on that spot. How horrid, cried Mrs Otis. I don't at all care for blood stains in a sitting room. It must be removed at once. The old woman smiled and answered in the same low, mysterious voice. It is the blood of Lady Eleanor Canterville, who was murdered on that very spot by her own husband, Sir Simon de Canterville, in 1575. Sir Simon survived her nine years and disappeared suddenly under very mysterious circumstances. His body has never been discovered. But his guilty spirit still haunts the chase. The blood stain has been much admired by tourists and others and cannot be removed. That is all nonsense, cried Washington Otis. Pinkerton's champion stain remover and paragon detergent will clean it up in no time. And before the terrified housekeeper could interfere, he had fallen upon his knees and was rapidly scouring the floor with a small stick of what looked like a black cosmetic. In a few moments, no trace of the bloodstain could be found. I knew Pinkertons could do it, he exclaimed triumphantly, as he looked around at his admiring family. But no sooner had he said these words than a terrible flash of lightning lit up the somber room. A fearful peal of thunder made them all start to their feet, and poor Mrs Umney fainted. In a few moments she came too, and quite upset, she sternly warned Mr Otis of some trouble coming to the house. I've seen things with my own eyes, sir, that would make any Christian's hair stand on end. And many a night I have not closed my eyes in sleep for the awful things that have been done here. Mr Otis, however, and his wife warmly assured the honest soul that they were not afraid of ghosts. After invoking the blessings of Providence on her new master and mistress, and making arrangements for an increase of salary, the old housekeeper tottered off to her room. The storm raged fiercely all night, but nothing of particular note occurred. 
Next morning, however, when they came down to breakfast, they found the terrible stain of blood once again on the floor. I don't think it can be the fault of the Paragon detergent, said Washington, for I've tried it with everything. It must be the ghost. He accordingly rubbed out the stain a second time. But the second morning, it appeared again. The third morning also it was there. Though the library had been locked up at night, Otis himself and the key carried upstairs. The whole family were now quite interested. Mr. Otis began to suspect that he had been too dogmatic in his denial of the existence of ghosts. That night, all doubts were removed forever. Mr. Otis was awakened by a curious noise in the corridor outside his room. It sounded like the clank of metal, and it seemed to be coming nearer every moment. He got up at once, struck a match, and looked at the time. It was exactly one o'clock. The strange noise still continued, and with it he heard distinctly the sound of footsteps. He put on his slippers, took a small oblong phial out of his dressing case, and opened the door. Right in front of him he saw, in the moonlight, an old man of terrible aspect. His eyes were as red burning coals. Long grey hair fell over his shoulders in matted coils. His garments, which were of an antique cut, were soiled and ragged, and from his wrists and ankles hung heavy manacles and rusty chives. My dear sir, said Mr. Otis calmly, I really must insist on your oiling those chains, and have brought you for that purpose a small bottle of the Tammany Rising Sun Lubricator. It is said to be completely efficacious upon one application, and there are several testimonials to that effect on the road from some of our most eminent native divines. I shall leave it here for you by the bedroom candles, and will be happy to supply you with more should you require it. With these words, the United States Minister laid the bottle down on a marble table and closing his door, retired to rest. For a moment, the Canterville ghost stood quite motionless in natural indignation. Then, dashing the bottle violently upon the polished floor, he fled down the corridor, uttering hollow groans and emitting a ghastly green light. Just, however, as he reached the top of the great oak staircase, a door was flung open, two little white-robed figures appeared, and a large pillow whizzed past his head. There was evidently no time to be lost, so, hastily adopting the fourth dimension of space as the means of escape, he vanished through the wainscoting, and the house became quite quiet. On reaching a small secret chamber in the left wing, he leaned up against a moonbeam to recover his breath, and began to try and realise his position. Never, in a brilliant and uninterrupted career of 300 years, had he been so grossly insulted. He thought of the four housemaids, who had gone into hysterics when he millioned at them through the curtains of one of the spare bedrooms. Of the rector of the parish, whose candle he had blown out as he was coming late one night from the library, who had become a perfect martyr to nervous disorders. The furore he had excited one lovely June evening by merely playing ninepins with his own bones upon the lawn tennis ground. And after all this, some wretched modern Americans were to come and offer him the rising sun lubricator and throw pillows at his head. It was quite unbearable. No ghost in history had ever been treated in this manner. Accordingly, he determined to have vengeance, and remained till daylight in an attitude of deep thought. For the rest of the week, however, the family were left undisturbed. The only thing that excited any attention being the continual renewal of the blood stain on the library floor. Now this certainly was very strange, as the door was always locked at night by Mr Otis, and the windows kept closely barred. The chameleon-like colour also of the stain excited a good deal of comment. Some mornings it was a dull red, then it would be vermilion, then a rich purple, and once they found it a bright emerald green. These kaleidoscopic changes naturally amused the party very much, 
and bets on the subject were freely made every evening. Now, the only person who did not enter into the joke was little Virginia, who, for some unexplained reason, was always a good deal distressed at the sight of the bloodstain, and very nearly cried the morning it was emerald green. The second appearance of the ghost was on Sunday night. Shortly after they had gone to bed, they were suddenly alarmed by a fearful crash in the hall. Rushing downstairs, they found that a large suit of old armour had become detached from its stand and had fallen on the stone floor, while seated in a high-backed chair was the Canterville ghost, rubbing his knees with an expression of acute agony on his face. The twins, having brought their pea-shooters with them, at once discharged two pellets on him with great accuracy of aim while the United States minister covered him with his revolver and called upon him, in accordance with the California etiquette, to hold up his hands. The ghost started up with a wild shriek of rage and swept through them like a mist, extinguishing what Washington Otis's candle as he passed, and so leaving them all in total darkness. On reaching the top of the staircase, he recovered himself and determined to give his celebrated peal of demonic laughter. This he had on more than one occasion found extremely useful. He accordingly laughed his most horrible laugh till the old vaulted roof rang and rang again. But hardly had the fearful echo died away when a door opened and Mrs. Otis came out in her dressing gown. I am afraid you are far from well, she said, and have bought you a bottle of Dr. Dobell's tincture. If it is indigestion, you will find it a most excellent remedy. The ghost glared at her fury and began at once to make preparations for turning himself into a large black dog, an accomplishment for which he was justly renowned. The sound of approaching footsteps, however, made him hesitate in his fell purpose, so he contented himself with becoming faintly phosphorescent and vanished with a deep churchyard groan, just as the twins had come up to him. On reaching his room, he entirely broke down and became a prey to the most violent agitation. The vulgarity of the twins and the gross materialism of Mrs. Otis were naturally extremely annoying, but what really distressed him most of all was that he'd been on unable to put on the suit of mail. He had hoped that even modern Americans would be thrilled by the sight of a spectre in armour. Besides, it was his own suit. He'd worn it with great success at the Kenilworth tournament, and had been highly complimented on it by no less a person than the Virgin Queen herself. Yet, when he put it on, he had been completely overpowered by the weight of the huge breastplate and steel cask, and had fallen heavily on the stone pavement, barking both his knees severely and bruising the knuckles of his right hand. For some days after this, he was extremely ill, and hardly stirred out of his room at all, except to keep the bloodstain in proper repair. However, by taking great care of himself, he recovered and resolved to make a third attempt to frighten the United States minister and his family. He selected Friday, August the 17th for his appearance and spent most of that day in looking over his wardrobe, ultimately deciding in favour of a large slouched hat with a red feather, a winding sheet, frill, wrists and neck, and a rusty dagger. Towards evening, a violent storm of rain came on, and the wind was so high, all the windows and doors in the old house shook and rattled. In fact, it was just such weather as he loved. His plan of action was this. He was to make his way quietly to Washington Otis's room, gibber at him from the foot of the bed, and stab himself three times in the throat to the sound of low music. He bore Washington a special grudge, being quite aware that it was he who was in the habit of removing the famous Canterville bloodstain by means of Pinkerton's Paragon detergent. Having reduced the reckless and foolhardy youth to a condition of abject terror, he was then to proceed to the room occupied by the United States Minister and his wife, and there to place a clammy hand on Mrs. Otis's forehead, while he hissed into her trembling husband's ear the awful secrets of the charnel house. With regard to little Virginia, he had not quite made up his mind. She had never insulted him in any way, 
and she was prim and gentle. A few hollow groans from the wardrobe, he thought, would be more than sufficient. As for the twins, hmm, he was quite determined to teach them a lesson. The first thing to be done was, of course, to sit upon their chests, so as to produce the stifling sensation of nightmare. Then to stand between them in the form of a green, ice-cold corpse, till they became paralysed with fear. And finally, to throw off the winding sheet and crawl round the room with white bleached bones and one rolling eyeball. At half past ten, he heard the family to bed. For some time, he was disturbed by wild shrieks of laughter from the twins, who, with the light-hearted gaiety of schoolboys, were evidently amused themselves before they retired to rest. But at quarter past eleven, all was still. And as midnight sounded, he sallied forth. The owl beat against the window panes. The raven croaked from the old yew tree. And the wind wandered, moaning round the house like a lost soul. But the Otis family slept, unconscious of their doom. He stepped stealthily out of the wainscoting, with an evil smile on his cruel, wrinkled mouth. On and on he glided, like an evil shadow, the very darkness seeming to loathe him as he passed. Finally, he reached the corner of the passage that led to luckless Washington's room. For a moment, he paused there and chuckled to himself and turned the corner. But no sooner had he done so, with a piteous wail of terror, he fell back and hid his blanched face in his long bony hands. Right in front of him was standing a horrible actor motionless as a carven image and monstrous as a madman's dream. Its head was bald and furnished, its face round and fat and white, and hideous laughter seemed to have writhed its features into an eternal grin. From the eyes streamed rays of scarlet light, the mouth was a wide well of fire, and a hideous garment like to his own swathed with its silent snows the titan form. On its breast was pinned a placard with strange writing in antique characters. Some scroll of shame, it seemed, some record of wild sins, some awful calendar of crime, and, with its right hand, aloft a falchion of gleaming steel. Never having seen a ghost before, he naturally was terribly frightened, and, after a second hasty glance at the awful phantom, fled back to his room, tripping up on his long winding sheet as he sped down the corridor. Once in the privacy of his own apartment, he flung himself down on a small pallet bed and hid his face under the clothes. After a time, however, that brave old Canterville spirit asserted itself, and he determined to go and speak to the other ghost as soon as it was daylight. Accordingly, just as the dawn was touching the hills with silver, he returned toward the where he had first laid eyes on the grisly phantom, feeling that, after all, two ghosts were better than one, and that, by the aid of his new friend, he might see grapple with the twins. On reaching the spot, however, a terrible sight met his gaze. Something had evidently happened to the spectre, for the light had entirely faded from its hollow eyes. The gleaming falchion had fallen from his hand, and he was leaning up against the wall in a strained and uncomfortable-looking attitude. He rushed forward and seized it in his arms, when, to his horror, the head slipped off and rolled on the floor. The body assumed a recumbent posture, and he found himself clasping a white dimity bed curtain, with a sweeping brush, a kitchen cleaver, and a hollow turnip lying at his feet. Unable to understand this curious transformation, he clutched the placard with feverish haste, and there, in the grey morning light, he read these fearful words. Ye Otis Ghost, ye only true and original spook, beware of ye imitations. All others are counterfeit. The whole thing flashed before him. He'd been tricked, foiled, and outwitted. The old cantable look came into his eyes. He ground his toothless gums together, 
and raising his withered hands high above his head, swore a terrible oath. At half past seven, the arrival of the housemaids made him give up his fearful vigil, and he stalked back to his room, thinking of his vain oath and battle purpose. There he consulted several books of ancient chivalry, of which he was exceedingly fond. He then retired to a comfortable lead coffin and stayed there till evening. The next day, the ghost was weak and tired. The terrible excitement of the last four weeks was beginning to have its effect. His nerves were completely shattered and he started at the slightest noise. For five days, he kept his room and at last made up his mind to give up the point of the bloodstain on the library floor. Well, if the Otis family did not want it, they clearly did not deserve it. They were evidently people on a low, material plane of existence and quite incapable of appreciating the symbolic value of such phenomena. It is quite true that his life had been very evil, but upon the other hand, he was most conscientious in all things connected with the supernatural. For the next three Saturdays, accordingly, he traversed the corridor as usual between midnight and three o'clock, taking every possible precaution against being either seen or heard. He removed his boots, trod as lightly as possible on the old worm-eaten boards, wore a large black velvet cloak and was careful to use the rising sun lubricator for oiling his chains. It was with a great deal of difficulty that he brought himself to adopt this last mode of protection. However, one night, while the family were at dinner, he slipped into Mr Otis's bedroom and carried off the bottle. He felt a little humiliated at first, but afterwards was sensible enough to see that there was a great deal to be said for the invention, and, to a certain degree, it served his purpose. One night, he glided out of the wainscoting and crept down the corridor. On reaching the room occupied by the twins, he found the door just ajar. Wishing to make an effective entrance, he flung it wide open, when a heavy jug of water fell right down on him, wetting him to the skin and just missing his left shoulder by a couple of inches. At the same moment, he heard stuffed shrieks of laughter proceeding from the four-poster bed. The shock to his nervous system was so great that he fled back to his room as hard as he could go, and the next day he was up with a severe cold. He now gave up all hope of ever frightening this rude American family and contented himself, as a rule, with creeping about the passages in slippers, with a thick red muffler round his throat for fear of draughts, and a small aquabus, in case he should be attacked by the twins. The final blow he received occurred on the 19th of September. He'd gone downstairs to the great entrance hall, feeling sure that there, at any rate, he would be quite unmolested. He was simply but neatly clad in a long shroud the churchyard mould, had tied up his jaw with a strip of yellow linen and carried a small lantern and a sexton spade. It was about a quarter past two in the morning and as far as he could ascertain no one was stirring. As he was strolling towards the library however to see if there were any traces left of the blood stain, suddenly there leaped out from him a dark corner two figures who waved their arms wildly about their heads and shrieked out boo in his ear. Seized with a panic, which, under the circumstances, was only natural, he rushed for the staircase, but found Washington Otis waiting for him there with a big garden syringe. And being thus hemmed in by his enemies on every side and driven almost to bay, he vanished into the great iron stove, which, fortunately for him, was not lit, and had to make his way home to the flues and chimneys, arriving at his own room in a terrible state of dirt, disorder and despair. After this, he was not seen for any nocturnal expedition. The twins lay in wait for him on several occasions, and strewed the passages with nutshells every night to the great annoyance of their parents and the sons, but it was to no avail. It was quite evident that his feelings were so wounded that he would not appear. Mr. Otis subsequently resumed his great work on the history of the Democratic Party, of which he had been engaged for some years. Mrs. Otis organised a wonderful clam bake, which amazed the whole county, 
The boys took to lacrosse, poker and other American national games, and Virginia rode about the lanes on her pony, accompanied by the young Duke of Cheshire, who had come to spend the last week of his holidays at Canterville Chase. It was generally assumed that the ghost had gone away. And in fact, Mr Otis wrote a letter to Thect to Lord Canterville, who in reply expressed his great pleasure at the news and sent his congratulations. The Otises, however, were deceived, but the ghost was still in the house, and though now almost an invalid, was by no means ready to let matters rest. A few days after this, Virginia and her curly-haired cavalier went out riding on Broccoli Meadows, where she tore her habit so badly in getting to a hedge that on their return home, she made up her mind to go up by the back staircase so as not to be seen. As she was running past the tapestry chamber, the door of which happened to be open, she fancied she saw someone inside, and thinking it was her mother's maid, who sometimes used to bring her work there, looked in to ask her to mend her habit. To her immense surprise, however, it was the Canterville ghost himself. He was sitting by the window, watching the gold of the yellowing trees fly through the air. His head was leaning on his hand, and his whole attitude was one of extreme depression. Indeed, so forlorn and so much out of repair did he look that little Virginia, whose first idea had been to run away and lock herself in a her room, was filled with pity and determined to try and comfort him. I am so sorry for you, she said, but my brothers are going back to Eden tomorrow, and then if you behave yourself, no one will annoy you. It is absurd asking me to behave myself, he answered, looking round in astonishment at the pretty little girl who had ventured to press him. Quite absurd. I must rattle my chains and groan through keyholes and walk about at night, if that's what you mean. It is my only reason for existing. Well, it's no reason at all for existing. And you know you have been very wicked. That Mrs. Umney told us the first day we arrived here that you had killed your wife. Well, I, I, I quite admit it, uh, said the ghost. Uh, but it was a purely family matter and concerned no one else. It was wrong to kill anyone, said Virginia. My wife was very plain. Never had my ruffs properly starched. I knew nothing about cookery. However, it's no matter now. It was all over. And I don't think it was very nice of her brothers to starve me to death, even though I did kill her. Starve you to death? Oh, Mr. Ghost. I mean, Sir Simon. Are you hungry? I have a sandwich in my case. Would you like it? No, thank you. <clears throat> I never eat anything now. Well, it's very kind of you all the same. And you are much nicer than the rest of your horrid, rude, vulgar, dishonest family. Stop, cried Virginia, stamping her foot. It is you who are rude and horrid and vulgar. And as for dishonesty, you know you stole the piece out of my box to try and furbish up that ridiculous bloodstain in the library. First, you took on my reds, including the vermilion. I couldn't do any more nonsense. Then you took the emerald green and the chrome yellow. And finally, I had nothing left but indigo and Chinese white, and could only do moonlight scenes, which are always depressing to look at and not at all easy to paint. I never told on you. I was very much annoyed. And it was most ridiculous, the whole thing. For who ever heard of emerald green blood? Well, really, said the ghost. What was I to do? It's a very difficult thing to get real blood nowadays. As your brother began it all with his paragon detergent, I certainly saw no reason why I should not have your paints. As for colour, that's always a matter of taste. The Cantervilles have blue blood, for instance. The very bluest in England. But I know you Americans don't care for this kind. Well, you know nothing about it. And the best thing you can do is to emigrate and improve your mind. My father will be only too happy to give you a free passage. And though there is a heavy duty on spirits of every kind, there will be no difficulty about the customs. Once in New York, you are sure to be a great success. I know lots of people there 
would give a hundred thousand dollars to have a grandfather, and much more than that to have a family ghost. I am so lonely and so unhappy, and I really don't know what to do. I want to go to sleep, but I cannot. Well, that's quite absurd. You've got to bed and blow out the candle. I have not slept for three hundred years, he said sadly, as Virginia's beautiful eyes opened in wonder. And I am so tired. Virginia grew quite grave and came towards him, and kneeling down at his side, looked up into his old withered face. Poor, poor ghost, she murmured. Have you no place where you can sleep? Far away, beyond pine woods, he answered in a low, dreamy voice. There is a little garden. There the grass grows long and deep. There are the great white stars of the hemlock flower. There the nightingale sings all night long. And the cold crystal moon looks down. And the yew tree spreads out its giant arms over the sleepers. Virginia's eyes grew dim with tears, and she hid her face in her hands. You mean the garden of death? she whispered. Yes, death. Death must be so beautiful to lie in the brown earth with the grasses waving above one's head and listen to silence. But have no yesterday and no tomorrow. To forget time, to forget life, to be at peace. Now you can help me. You can open for me the portals of death's house. For love, it's always with you, and love is stronger than death is. Virginia trembled. A cold shudder ran through her, and for a few moments there was silence. She felt as if she was in a terrible dream. Then the ghost spoke again, and his voice was like the sighing of the wind. Have you ever read the old prophecy on the library window? Oh, often, cried a little girl, looking up. I know it quite well. It's painted in curious black letters. It's difficult to read. There are only six lines. When a golden girl can win, prayer from out the lips of sin. When the barren almond bears, and a little child gives away its tears. Then shall all the house be still, and peace shall come to Canterville. But I don't know what they mean. They mean said sadly but you must weep me for my sins because i have no tears and pray with me for my soul because i have no faith then if you have always been sweet and good and gentle the angel of death will have mercy on me you will see fearful shapes and darkness and wicked voices will whisper in your ear but they will not harm you but against the purity of a little child the powers of hell cannot prevail virginia made no answer and the ghost wrung his hands in wild despair as he looked down at her bowed golden head suddenly she stood up very pale and with a strange light in her eyes i am not afraid she said firmly and i will ask the angel to have mercy on you. He rose from his seat with a faint cry of joy, and taking her hand, bent over it with old-fashioned grace and kissed it. His fingers were as cold as ice, and his lips burnt like fire. But Virginia did not falter, as he led her across the dusky room. On the faded green tapestry were broided little huntsmen. They blew their tasseled horns, and with their tiny hands waved to her to go back, Go back, little Virginia, they cried. Go back. But the ghost clutched her hand more tightly, and she shut her eyes against them. Horrible animals with lizard tails and goggle eyes blinked at her from the carven chimney piece and murmured, Beware, little Virginia. Beware. We may never see you again. But the ghost glided on more swiftly, and Virginia did not listen. When he reached the end of the room, he stopped and muttered some words she could not understand. She opened her eyes and saw the wall slowly fading away like a mist, 
and a great black cavern in front of her. A bitter cold wind swept around her, and she felt something pulling at her dress. Quick, quick, cried the girl, or it'll be too late. In a moment, the wainscoting went close behind them, and the tapestry chamber was empty. About ten minutes later, the bell rang for tea, and as Virginia did not come down, Mrs Otis sent up one of the footmen to tell her. After a little time, he returned and said he could not find Miss Virginia anywhere. As she was in the habit of going out to the garden every evening to get flowers for the dinner table, Mrs Otis was not at all alarmed at first. But when six o'clock struck and Virginia did not appear, she became really agitated and sent the three boys out to look for her while she herself and Mr Otis searched every room in the house. At half past six, the boys came back and said they could find no trace of Virginia anywhere. They were all now in the greatest state of excitement and did not know what to do. It was evident that, for that night at any rate, Virginia was lost to them. Supper was a melancholy meal, as hardly anyone spoke. When they had finished, Mr Otis, in spite of the entreaties of the young Duke of Cheshire, ordered them all to bed, saying that nothing more could be done that night, and that he would telegraph first thing in the morning to Scotland Yard for some detectives to be sent down immediately. Just as they were passing out of the dining room, midnight began to boom from the clock tower, and when the last stroke sounded, they heard a crash and a sudden shrill cry. A dreadful peal of thunder shook the house, a strain of unearthly music floated through the air, and a panel at the top of the staircase flew back with a loud noise, and out of landing, looking very pale and white, and with a little casket in her hand, stepped Virginia. In a moment, they had all rushed up to her. Mistress clasped her passionately in her arms. The Duke smothered her with violent kisses, and the twins executed a wild war dance round the group. Good heavens, child, where have you been? said Mr Otis, rather angrily, thinking that she'd been playing some foolish trick on them. We've been looking all over for you, and your mother has been frightened to death. You must never play these practical jokes any more. Except on the ghost, shrieked the twins as they capered about. My own darling, thank God you were found. You must never leave my side again, murmured Mrs Otis as she kissed the trembling child and smoothed the tangled gold of her hair. Papa said Virginia quietly. I have been with a ghost. He is dead, and you must come and see him. He had been very wicked, but he was really sorry for all he had done, and he gave me this box of beautiful jewels before he died. The whole family gazed at her in mute amazement, but she was quite grave and serious, and turning round, she led them through the opening in the wainscoting down a narrow secret corridor. Washington following with a lighted candle, which he caught up from the table. Finally, they came to a great oak door, studded with rusty nails. When Virginia touched it, it swung back on its heavy hinges, and they found themselves in a little low room, with a vaulted ceiling and one tiny grated window. Embedded in the wall was a huge iron ring, and chained to it was a gaunt skeleton that was stretched out at full length on the stone floor, and seemed to be trying to grasp with its long fleshless fingers an old-fashioned trencher and ewer that were placed just out of touch. The jug had evidently been once filled with water, as it was covered inside with green mould. There was nothing on the trencher but a pile of dust. Virginia knelt down beside the skeleton, and folding her little hands together, began to pray silently while the rest of the party looked on in wonder at the terrible tragedy whose secret was now disclosed to them. Ah, suddenly exclaimed one of the twins, who had been looking out of the window to try and discover in what wing of the house the room was situated. The old withered almond tree has blossomed. I can see the flowers quite plainly in the moonlight. God has forgiven him, said Virginia gravely, as she rose to her feet and the beautiful light seemed to illumine her face. What an angel you are, cried the young duke, and he put his arm round her neck and kissed her. Four days 
After these curious incidents, a funeral started from Canterville Chase at about 11 o'clock at night. The hearse was drawn by eight black horses, each of which carried on its head a great tuft of nodding ostrich plumes, and the leaden coffin was covered by a rich purple pall, on which was embroidered in gold the Canterville coat of arms. By the side of the hearse and the coaches walked the servants with lighted torches, and the whole procession was wonderfully impressive. Lord Canterville was a chief mourner, having come up from Wales to attend the funeral, and sat in the first carriage along with little Virginia. Then came the United States minister and his wife, then Washington and the three boys, and in the last carriage was Mrs Omni, the housekeeper. A deep grave had been dug in the corner of the churchyard, just under the old yew tree, and the service was read in a most impressive manner by the rector. As the coffin was being lowered into the grave, Virginia stepped forward and laid on it a large cross made of pink and white almond blossoms. As she did so, the moon came out from behind a cloud and flooded with its silent silver the little churchyard. From a distant copse, a nightingale began to sing. She thought of the ghost description of the Garden of Death, her eyes coming dim with tears, and she hardly spoke a word during the drive home. The next morning, before Lord Canterville went up to town, Mr Otis had an interview with him on the subject of the jewels the ghost had given to Virginia. They were perfectly magnificent, especially a certain ruby necklace with this old Venetian setting, and their value was so great that Mr Otis felt considerable scruples about allowing his daughter to accept them. Lord Canterville, however, insisted the minister should allow his daughter to retain the present the ghost had given her. And when, in the spring of 1890, the young Duchess of Chester was presented at the Queen's first drawing room on the occasion of her marriage, her jewels were the universal theme of admiration. Poor Virginia received the coronet, which is the reward of all good little American girls, and was married to her boy lover as soon as he came of age. They were both so charming, and they loved each other so much that everyone was delighted. Mr Otis walked up the aisle of St George's, Hanover Square, with his daughter leaning on his arm, the proudest man, the whole length and breadth of England. The Duke and Duchess, after the honeymoon was over, went down to Canterville Chase, and on the day after their arrival, walked over to the lonely churchyard by the pine woods. It had been decided to engrave on Sir Simon's tombstone just his initials and the verse from the library window. The Duchess had brought with her some lovely roses, which she strewed upon the grave, and after they had stood by it for some time, strolled into the ruined chancel of the old abbey, where they sat down, a fallen pillar. Virginia, a wife should have no secrets from her husband. Dear Cecil, I have no secrets from you. Yes, you have, he answered, smiling. You've never told me what happened to you when you were locked up with the ghost. I have never told anyone, Cecil, said Virginia gravely. Well, I know that, but you might tell me. Oh, please don't ask me, Cecil. I cannot tell you. Poor Sir Simon. I owe him a great deal. Yes, don't laugh, Cecil. I really do. He made me see what life is and what death signifies and why love is stronger than both. The Duke rose and kissed his wife lovingly. You can have your secret as long as I have your heart, he murmured. You have always that, Cecil. And you will tell our children one day, won't you? Virginia blushed. Stephen, oh, there we are. thank you so much for such a wonderful reading. Thank you. It was fun to do. <laughs> uh, thank you to our, uh, our uh, audience this evening. Um, you are the premier Hexham team of events um, audience, and you can say that you were there at the very first one. Yeah. 
We hope to do more of these sorts of events in the future. So do look out on the Hexam TV Facebook page, Twitter feed and Instagram mm. page for a future events coming up. And um, I hope you enjoyed uh, Stephen's reading as much as I did. I thought it was excellent. It was really, really a great story for Halloween. Thank you. No, it was lovely. And thank you very much, Pete, for reaching out to me so we could start this little uh, uh, exercise off and see where it goes. And thank you, audience, too, for just being there. I could, I could feel you out there. And please, those of you who know me, you know, or even if you don't, you know, you can give it any feedback to, to what we've done tonight. I think, you know, Pete and I would both value that a lot. But for now, thank you very much. Good night. And of course, keep safe. Thank you. Well, good night.